Our Teachers College, the first and biggest school of education in the nation. Here, in a single square block in the heart of New York City, we have invented and reinvented the modern K-12 classroom and the community school. We've launched and reshaped so many fields of inquiry in education, health, psychology, policy, and leadership. And today, we're shaping the future in racial literacy, education in human sexuality, nutrition policy, community health, global mental health, and emotional and psychological resilience. From generation to generation, our faculty, students, and graduates have tackled society's most pressing challenges and improved the lives of the people and communities we've served. Think of us as an incubator and accelerator for creating a better world. So tune in to Teachers College, the premier address for informed conversations about how to create a healthier, better educated, more equitable, and more just world. No matter where you are, you're right in our neighborhood. Hello and good evening. Welcome to the official book launch of The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization by Peter Coleman. I'm Hakim Williams and this evening I will serve as your moderator. Today I'm coming from Gettysburg. I teach at Gettysburg College. And as you know, Gettysburg sits in the American psyche in very interesting ways. And so to me, this book is rather salient for these times in the United States of America. Today, I'm going to introduce Peter Coleman, who will present a few remarks on the book. And then Peter Coleman and John Haidt will sit in conversation, and then I will join to moderate a Q&A. Please allow me to read a brief bio regarding Peter Coleman. Peter Coleman is professor of psychology and education at Teachers College and the Earth Institute, both housed at Columbia University. He directs the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution, is founding director of the Institute for Psychological Science and Practice, and is executive director of Columbia University's Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity. Dr. Coleman is a renowned expert on conflict resolution and sustainable peace. His current research focuses on conflict intelligence and systemic wisdom as meta competencies for navigating conflict constructively across all levels, from families to companies to communities to nations. He has authored over 100 articles and written or edited a dozen books, including three editions of the award-winning Handbook of Conflict Resolution, Theory and Practice, the award-winning Making Conflict Work, Harnessing the Power of Disagreement, as well as the 5% Finding Solutions to Seemingly Impossible Conflicts, Attracted to Conflict, Dynamic Foundations of Destructive Social Relations, and Psychological Components of Sustainable Peace. Dr. Coleman is also a certified mediator and consultant to various groups and organizations, and most recently served in an informal advisory capacity on fighting toxic polarization in America to the Biden-Harris transition team. Please join me in welcoming author Peter Coleman. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I, uh, I am, we were almost able to do this in person, but um, good to be here and good to have you all here uh, with us. Thank you, uh, Hakeem, for that introduction. I want to thank John Haight for being with us this evening and for uh, being in conversation with me. And a special uh, shout out to Danielle Kuhn, 
It's the associate director of the center and Becca Bass, um, Solia Stevis and Trish McNich uh, McNichols um, and the staff of the ICCCR, Teachers College and Columbia University Press. Everybody has worked together to make this happen tonight. Uh, no small feat um, to do this virtually. The book is about escaping uh, a trap of toxic polarization. I started to think about this and work on this uh, after Donald Trump was elected president uh, and the political rhetoric got more and more ugly and incendiary. Um, and at that time I started to have conversations with various uh, organizations around the country that were working tirelessly to try to bring the temperature down around political division, divisiveness in the country. But some of them seemed to be somewhat I would say misinformed about the science on how to do that. And in some cases they were having a, a perhaps negative impact at times. So one example I'll give of a very well-intentioned association is a group, uh, an initi initiative called My Country Talks. This started in Germany. Uh, now there are 30 different nations that are doing this initiative. And essentially what they do is they have a website, they invite you to go to their website, answer some questions on divisive issues, and then they match you with someone in your area and encourage you to go off, have a, have a beer, a cup of coffee, and a conversation with that person. And many of these go quite well, but if you push them, some of them actually backfire uh, and don't go as well as we had hoped, like this one. This is a conversation that was fostered and uh, facilitated by one of the journalists uh, at the founding organization, which is a magazine called Die Zeit in Germany. He came to America after Trump was elected and he met these two gentlemen. Um, one was a Trump supporter, one was a never Trumper. And um, he grew to like them, know them well, and over time decided to bring them together and uh, facilitate a an encounter, a conversation. And so they did come together um, and things went pretty well until somebody mentioned uh, Colin Kaepernick and his uh, protests with, around the NFL. And from that, there, were, there was an explosion, there was rage. And there were the, as, as um, the journalist said, F-bombs started to fly. And eventually they, men, both men got enraged, left and refused to ever have contact again. These kinds of encounters are happening too frequently with these kinds of settings. Um, and it's because some conflicts are just different. Um, some divisions are deeper and they don't lend themselves to being addressed by simple contact and simple conversations, especially when the disputants are you know, true believers, are, are passionate and, and living in opposing media ecosystems like this group, and this group and too many others today. So that's why I wrote this book. Uh, it was the prodding of my agent, uh, Jessica Papin, to really share what the science, what the research tells us about how to address these kinds of intense, deeply ensconced, prolonged divisions, or at least how we can begin to bring the guardrails back in so that our differences don't lead to worse levels of violence than we've seen. So tonight, what I'm gonna do in my remi remaining few minutes is talk a little bit about the problem of toxic polarization. Uh, spoiler alert, it's bad and it's often terribly misunderstood. The science, which actually is quite good, but also I think is misunderstood. And then mostly what we can do about it. That's what this book focuses on not only what the science has to offer, but how do you translate that into your own life to make a difference uh, as you go forward? Um, so first I wanna just say polarization, not a bad thing. Polarization in science is really just when a, when a system of elements get charged in a way that they're both sort of attracted to and, and, and repelled by two opposing poles in a system. And political polarization, in fact, is necessary, right? In a two-party system like ours, you want to have passionate individuals and groups that have informed debate about moving things forward or keeping them as is, you know, in order to move our uh, society forward in ways that are constructive. But when a society starts to cluster into red and blue echo chambers like this, this is an image off of Twitter, 
and how those conversations basically just become insular and circular, this can become toxic because we really stop talking to the other, stop learning from them. And this is really the state that we're in. So toxic polarization is different from typical everyday polarization or difference. Um, and there are certain trends I think that you should be mindful of. One is uh, that there, we have spikes in hate and enmity for the other side. This has been something that has been growing for decades. We used to be much more tolerant and accepting of people with political differences. Today, 80 some percent hold the other side in disfavor, think they're unintelligent, selfish, and trying to harm the country. And those kinds of effective cores are central to the tensions that we feel today. But in addition, we're, we're thinking in much more simplistic tribal terms. Uh, Pew Research Center practice something called ideological consistency. They measure people's attitudes on 10 separate issues, uh, you know, uh, immigration, healthcare, uh, homosexual rights. And then they look at the degree to which those start to collapse and, and be correlated within the tribes, within Republicans and Democrats, and how much they start to separate from one another. And that's what we've seen is basically the views on these 10 different issues become highly correlated, which basically means that we're not paying attention. We're not paying close attention to the realities of these immensely complicated policy issues. We're really just joining our team and basically following their lead. Um, so we have affective, ideological, our identities are collapsing. So within each of the tribes, you see ideological identities and religious and racial and political identities all sort of joining. Um, we see increases in perceptual distortion, our view of the other side, of how they're at, how extreme their attitudes are, are much more extreme than they actually are. Um, and in these kinds of dynamics, you also see oversized effects of the extreme voices, the loudest voices in the room. On Twitter, for example, 80% of the content is generated by 10% of the users. So a lot of the discourse on polarization that we hear in the media and that we hear in, and that we see on the internet um, comes from a very small group. They're framing and driving the conversation. And one of the most concerning differences is that we are geographically and virtually sorting right into not just rural, urban, uh, um, isolated uh, pockets, but also even within cities. The, uh, the New York Times recently published an article where they looked at urban areas. And if you see this increasing partisan segregation happening really physically, people are moving away from people who differ politically from them and moving towards groups, uh, towards people um, like them. This is where I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in this bubble of blue. So we're physically separating from the other tribes and joining our own. And commensurate with this, we see rises in hate groups, in hate crimes, and in political violence. And this has been happening again for a while, but particularly spiked during the Trump administration. Uh, white nationalist hate groups grew 55% in that era and spikes in hate crimes have grown considerably um, as has political violence. Acts of political violence are on the rise in this country. So these different trends all are coming together to promote what I call a sort of form of mass American psychosis where we're really living in these parallel universes where we look at the same events or see the same events, but understand and experience uh, very different realities in association with them. And this is not a, a, a tenable or sustainable um, way to process information in our society. But what, one of the things I wanna emphasize is that this is not about Donald Trump. This is part of a more than 50 year pattern of increasing escalation and increasing polarization that has been happening in Washington, D.C. This is uh, voting patterns in Washington, D.C. And the, the higher the lines, the more, the, the, the less that Republicans and Democrats cross the aisle and support each other. That's been on the increase in the mid, since the mid-1970s. And really today, we're at a, 
a point of almost total deadlock. But it's also been happening on the streets. It's been happening in communities. You see the national divisions being echoed and fed by divisions in our homes and our communities. So this is a, a big problem. One of the things I did was to turn to the science to try to understand what the research tells us about the nature of this problem. And if you read it carefully, you see that there are many useful insights that come from scientific research about what is causing this long-term pattern and making us so stuck. And it's everything from differences in brain sensitivity of red and blue Americans, basic ethnocentric, ethnocentric processes or authoritarianism at the individual level. And then you have these macro structural things like the fact that we have a two party winner take all political system, or we have governmental dysfunction or voter suppression efforts or gerrymandering or the internet sorting us or the entertainmentization of media. All of these are factors and all of them explain some piece of the variance as to why we are stuck. But none of them really explain a 50, 60 year pattern that seems to resist change. What does explain that is how these different elements begin to reinforce one another, right? So your attitudes and your beliefs and your relationships and the media you listen to and the internet and where you travel to and don't travel to, all of these things start to coalesce into very complex patterns that can become like overwhelmingly, like a sea of factors that is pulling us apart. And this is happening more and more today. So it's not just you and me and our attitudes or our relationship. It's these structural level factors that are really drawing us into these different tribes and these different camps. And if you remember, this is exactly what polarization looks like. It is a field of energy that's pulling us apart, but it's important to recognize that this is much bigger than any one of us. Now, this is what uh, these kinds of problems are what Karl Popper, who's a philosopher of science, uh, described as cloud problems. He said, in science or in life, we face two kinds of problems. One are clock problems. They're mechanical problems with our car and our toaster and our computers. And these are problems that you can kind of take apart, find the broken piece and put things back together. And they're much more manageable kinds of problems. But there's another category of problem, which he called clock problems. These are highly complex, dynamic, ever-changing, unpredictable kinds of problems. And that is where we're finding ourselves right now, is when these system of elements start pulling us together and they start to feed each other and align in ways that really create a kind of landscape for our life. They create these traps that we're easily pulled into, attracted to again and again and again about how we feel about them, how we feel about us, and how we feel about all of these issues. And when you see complex systems like this settle into these kinds of patterns, then they don't change. They become very change resistant. And when they do change, they change in very strange and odd ways. So one of the points I make in the book is that we need to think about these kinds of long-term problems differently than we typically do. Uh, and this is something that uh, I have studied with a team of people for 20 years. We've done research on when do these kinds of complex conflicts that divide us, when do they start to change? Like what are the conditions under which they change? And the good news here is that there are conditions when they do change. And there are a couple of basic ones that are happening today. So one condition that's important to recognize is that you need to have enough of the citizens fed up, exhausted, and really wanting change. They really need to be motivated to, to move to do something different. And the good news there is somewhere between 86 and 93% of Americans, the miserable middle majority today are tired and fed up and want to do something different. So that's the good news. Society also ideally is destabilized. And when there's periods of great instability, it's when we sort of step back, reflect and question our basic assumptions and our decision processes. And that can lead eventually to really dramatic changes. Again, the good news is we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of, well, we're at a time of great awareness of racial injustice where we're, we're 
in a, in a post-Trump presidency era, there are a lot of these major destabilizing factors that have rocked our world. And this is an ideal time to reset. But what people need to do is be able to see how to do that. They need to see a clear path of the way out. They need to see how other people are doing it. And that what that is what this book is about. This book has summarized the science into five principles about resetting and starting again, about finding positive deviants, finding groups and communities that are already doing good bridge building work that is informed by science, joining with them in con common cause, about figuring out ways to complicate your life, the information you take in, what you read, who you listen to, who you talk to, so that it's not so simple to oversimplify and essentialize the other, to move physically with groups of people. If we get up, um, the, the, the field of peace building is used to having people sit at a table and try to talk out problems. And that works most of the time, but not with problems that have really become embodied in our sort of neural structures. So what we've found is actually getting people up and moving and working and cooking together or building homes together or gardening together. Those kinds of processes put people in sync and start to open them up to different kinds of relationships and then ultimately the need to adapt. So the book goes into the scientific principles behind all of these and that it culminates in a translation of these for simple rules for your life simple nudges that you can make when you find yourself, feel yourself trapped in some kind of impossible toxic dynamic, what are the things that you can do that could help you pivot um, and perhaps take a different path? But in order to understand the more deeply, you need to buy the book and then ideally go to this website that Becca Bass created with me, which will give you a a uh, sense of some of the exercises and some of the activities that can help you find a way out. So that is my talk for now. It probably went way too long, but I want to thank you. And, um, and I think we're going to bring John in. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for giving a synopsis of the book and you're just giving a teaser. I really recommend that people get it. It's very rare that I will cuddle up in bed with an academic book. And I did with this one. So. <laughs> Um, I also want to give a shout out to audience members, folks from all over the world are tapping into this conversation here today, folks from Mexico, Japan, Jamaica, and across the United States, because although the book is centered on the United States here, it, I think it has resonances for folks all across the world. So thank you, audience members, for tuning in. I want to introduce John Haidt, and please allow me a moment to read his fabulous bio. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist at New York University's Stern School of Business. His research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of American progressives, conservatives, and libertarians. His three books are The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and the coddling of the American mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. This was co-authored with Greg Lukainoff. He is the co-founder of heterodoxacademy.org, a collaboration among nearly 2,500 professors who are working to increase viewpoint diversity and freedom of inquiry in universities. He is also the co-founder of Open Mind Platform, an educational technology platform that equips people with the mindset and skill set to communicate constructively across differences. Open Mind is also collaborating with Peter Coleman on research. Please join me in welcoming John Haidt. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Hakeem. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, while I was listening to your, your talk, I just went back through my email to find out uh, when we first met. And I discovered, I hadn't realized this, but in 2009, you invited me to contribute a chapter to a book you were working on. And I kind of blew you off and said, oh, sorry, I'm busy writing my book, which was The Righteous Mind. Then in 2012, you invited me to another thing and I kind of blew you off, said, sorry, I'm busy, <laughs> I'm busy with the, the, you know, touring for The Righteous Mind. Yeah. And then I started to read about your work. I started to hear reports and, and read your academic articles. And then I started coming to you and I, I emailed you and I said, hey, I, I'm studying, you know, political conflict. Um, 
can I come up and visit you? And I came up in 2019 and you showed me around your lab. Uh, and I was just completely blown away by the way you had brought conflict into the lab in ways that you could study it, take fa you know recordings of facial expressions and psychophysiology, and you could analyze the words. And you know, I'm just telling the story so that the audience uh, understands what the relationship is between us and the degree to which I have just been amazed by the quality of your work and the timeliness of it. Uh, this is, you know, if, if that was a great thing to study five years ago, boy, is it a good thing to study today. Uh, so thank you for your work, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I really love the book. It's a very, very important book. Now, thank you, John. I, I want to say thank you for being here as well. And, and, and just in, for, in your defense, I believe one of those invitations that I offered was around the time that you were just having a child. Yeah, so my you, second so, child was born. Yes. So there so was some a, okay, good. Yeah. Thank you for forgiving me. Um, <laughs> so the, so, you know, I've been studying this 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 problem not as long as you have but for about 15 years and one of the the possibly the most helpful idea i've ever encountered was when i was reading the draft of your book to prepare a blurb for it an endorsement and while you mentioned it briefly in your talk the con the idea of complex dynamical systems many people on this call will have heard the word heard the phrase, but they don't really know what it is. It's a hard concept. Uh, you yeah. couldn't go into it in much detail in 10 minutes. Yeah. But for me, that's the transformative thing. You know, you mentioned it as being like cloud problems and clock problems, but I wonder if, if it might be good to work through for the audience. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about political polarization and especially, for example, let's take two examples. So let's take Twitter and Facebook. How did they change the landscape and the attractors and the balls rolling around and how could we unchange them? And then maybe we'll do a marriage because a lot of people are in relationships that get into, I mean, it's so enlightening to read your chapter on political polarization. And you mentioned this, that this is not just politics, this is all sorts of conflicts. So work it out for us to, to really help the audience understand um, what does it mean to look at any conflict, any long standing conflict as a matter of like dynamical systems and landscapes? Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. I mean, the way that typically we study things like conflicts, like polarization, is that we identify a piece of the problem that we think is important, and then we go deep on that piece of problem. And again, it might be neurological differences in brain, brain sensitivity, it might be attitudes, it might be values, right? And so what, as scientists, we're trained to do is try to find important pieces of a problem, understand them and see how they affect whether or not people become further and further apart and what are the conditions when they come back together. And as I was trying to show in that list of factors, there is a lot of good research, both at the individual psychological and even neurological level, as well as communities and families, and then at the macro structural level about these different factors. What Complexity science allows us to do is say, okay, that's great. Those are really important pieces, but how do they kind of come together and start to align and feed each other in ways that create patterns like addiction, right? So addiction, um, addiction, substance abuse addiction is a biopsychosocial structural problem, right? It's in my biology, at some point it's in my physiology and biology, it's in my relationships, it's in, you know, where I go, where I live, and then ultimately, you know, how easy it is for me to get access to certain drugs, which has something <clears throat> to do with the economy and my wealth and, you know. So mm. all of those things line up and they create a pattern within us that becomes extremely difficult to break. Well, uh, Polarization is somewhat like that. In fact, there's recent research that's, that describes how the brain, when it taps into outrage, when you feel outrage, righteous, you know, a sense of righteousness, the righteous mind, uh, it, it triggers in the brain a part of the, what they call the pleasure centers in the brain that, that's very similar to what you know, narcotics trigger in the brain. And so there is an addictive quality to that experience. Again, it's not only my experience of that, my brain firing in certain areas, it's how my relationships reinforce that, the media reinforces that, and all of these other structures. So ultimately, what we try to understand is not how do any one of those pieces explain the pattern, but how do all of those things start to come together and create 
what are called attractors. Attractors are patterns that we get sucked into like drug addiction, like falling in love. Falling in love is an attractor pattern, literally, right? And, and these are patterns that are caused by a variety of different things, but we fall into them again and again. Sometimes they become destructive and toxic, but we can't escape them because in some ways the pattern is bigger than us. And that's what we try to do in describing the process, the science behind understanding how all of these pieces of a puzzle create a pattern in our life that feels inescapable. Okay, but so but the examples you gave us here, drug addiction and falling in love, are things that happen to an individual uh, who, of course, is in networks, but we're still looking at individual. Oh. And what I'm trying to understand is it, 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 it seemed to me, I've been studying polarization since about 2004, and oh. it seemed to me as though there was a glitch in the matrix sometime around 2014, 2015. And it's more than a glitch in the matrix. It was as though God changed the gravitational constant of the universe nice. and like, you know, I don't understand Einstein's theory of relativity, but we've all seen those images of like, you know, a planet exerting gra gravitational pull that's like warping a fabric. Yeah. And it seemed as though the fabric of social space time just fundamentally changed. And yeah. in research I've done elsewhere, it looks to me as though when Twitter put on the retweet button in 2009 and Facebook mm. copied it and the like button, so social media got really engaging. And also 2009, yeah. 2012, that's when everybody really got onto social media on a daily basis. Work out for us, uh, well, in other words, confirm my pet theory, please, Peter. No, work out for us how, yeah. how a technological change that comes in more rapidly than almost any other technological changes ever hit yeah. human beings. How could everyone getting on Twitter and Facebook, how does that change the landscape in ways that might have enhanced or that could be used to reduce polarization? So you're, you're absolutely right that, that social media platforms but also media in general and the sort of entertainmentization and politization of news media. These are major factors in what is continuing to pull us up. You know, what I do want to stress is that the patterns that we're continuing to follow today were set decades ago, but they did, be, these, are, these are accelerants, right? The, yeah. the internet is an accelerant, news media politization is an accelerant, um, and so you, we did see, and, and Donald Trump was an accelerant because of his divisive approach to leadership. So these are factors that have increased the intensity of polarization of these parallel universes and leading to, I would suggest January 6th, because they're so powerful. Let me say one thing. There's a story I tell quickly in the, um, in the book about uh, an experience that I had going to a pop-up meeting in Midtown, Manhattan about two years ago. It was called by a group on Twitter. I went, there were about a dozen folks there. In fact, Caroline Meal was there, we were colleague and mm -hmm. I, and it, and the focus of it was um, internet dialogue. And they, they uh, the facilitator wrote a question on the board that said, what kind of dialogue should we be having to promote a virtual, a healthy virtual society? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean by dialogue? And there was kind of silence in the room. And then I said, because dialogue is not, most of us, when we say dialogue, what we mean is debate. We mean, you have an idea, I challenge your idea, I listen to your response, I look for flaws in your logic, I weaponize it, I come after you, right? And ultimately, it's a game of winning. It's trying to win the argument. Um, and we believe that that's a superior process of kind of decision making and problem solving, but it's the opposite of dialogue. Dialogue is a process of opening and discovery right? It is a process where you listen and learn and you discover things about yourself and your own ambivalence or your own ideas, the other, their story and where, how they got to where they are, the issues and the complexity of the issues. We learn a lot during dialogue processes, but dialogue is not a process that is uh, common or familiar to Americans, right? We understand debate because we learn it in high school, we see it in our politicians, mm -hmm. we see it in political campaigns, we see it on law and order. That, you know, that process is debate, and that's what our go-to kind of engagement is. So I made this distinction in this room of internet titans where I said there's a big difference between debate and dialogue. And then there was, again, another period of silence. And then one of the co-founders of Facebook who happened to be there said, oh, well, if that is dialogue, then there's no major platform that we have that mm. promotes dialogue. 
that everything is about competition, social comparison, challenging, contention, being as provocative as you can. That's the, the coin of the realm, right? That's the currency. And he said, we really don't have major platforms other than Zoom where people can learn and discover together. And that is part of the business model of a lot of mainstream media and a lot of social media, which are these major accelerants of these tribal tendencies that have been you know, churning and increasing for decades. Okay, now that, that's great. I mean, that's horrible, but that's a, a, a good example <laughs> right. of how, so it's like you're saying there were these patterns building for 50 years or more, and yeah. then once social, so connecting people by Zoom or telephone is generally gonna be a good thing, but connecting them so that everything they say is being rated by an outside audience like combatants in the Colosseum and the, yeah. the people are applauding or they're throwing tomatoes, that's yeah. terrible. So whatever patterns were happening when social media comes in, it's like, boom, the, 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 the negative attractor spaces get deeper and Absolutely. wider and they suck everything into them. But okay, it's also great. because of, as I said, it's, 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 you're absolutely right. These are accelerants, but it is because of the business model of mm -hmm. the platforms and the immense success of these platforms, right? Yeah. There are, I don't know what, 3 billion people on Facebook right now. So it is so successful. It's tapping into these, you know, more primitive, competitive, contentious games that people get addicted to. Mm -hmm. That's the model that Instagram and, and, and others have followed, Twitter. And so that is what is being proliferated as opposed to an alternative. And alternatives would be spaces where you and I could listen and learn from one another. Yeah, well, that's that, right. And that's why we, we pay for telephone service, but we don't pay for Facebook because we're not the customers. We're the product. Right. And therefore, they have no incentive or little incentive to make it actually better for us. They just want more of us. Yeah. All right. So now let's apply this to, to interpersonal relationships. Uh, my parents were locked into there are certain ways they had of setting each other off. And right. I would talk to them like, well, dad, just like, don't react when she does that. Or mom, you know, let's just, you know, and it never worked. It didn't change anything. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? And what should people do? Like, do you have any advice for, I mean, everyone on this call has yeah. interpersonal conflicts that are longstanding. Um, how do you think about that? And how, what should they do? So uh, there was a great, great book in the 70s called Games People Play, which really are about these kinds of patterns and dynamics that people and couples fall into. And, um, you know, I, 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 I remember reading that when I was young. I think it was kind of a brilliant um, thing because it doesn't, that approach doesn't place the problem within me or within mm -hmm. you. It is a kind of dynamic that we get trapped into, right? What I always tell people today who are saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into Thanksgiving and I have you know, my brother-in-law or my uncle who is just insane in terms of politics and sets me off. Um, and so how, what do I do? And my question to them is always, what do you want to happen? What do you wanna see happen, right? Do you wanna go in, trigger the same things you always trigger and go up that you know, ladder? Or are you really interested in either A, learning a little bit about where they're coming from, what their story is, B, maybe changing the dynamics a little bit so that you too can say, well, these are the things that are important to me and these are this is how I see the world, which again, might start to shift things so that you both actually learn from one another. Maybe you don't agree, um, but it doesn't set off the same kind of pattern. So really there is a, a need for intentionality. If you're gonna go into conversations, if you're aware that you're about to go into a conversation, you have to ask yourself, what do I wanna do here? And do I really wanna set off this pattern that we always get into? Or am I willing to try something else? Um, and one way to do that again is to either ask questions. People like to be heard. People like mm -hmm. to have their stories being heard. You may not like their story, but if you probe and explore, it can start to shift their attitude. There's, there was great uh, neuroscience research by a, uh, a man named Emile Breno that passed away a couple of years ago. He was a neuroscientist who studied intergroup conflict. And what he found is that when people feel, you know, kind of low status, low power, or neglected, if they start to feel heard by someone on the other side, if they really genuinely feel heard, then it opens them up to start to shifting their attitudes. So one of the things I had been recommending to the Biden administration is that the first thing that they should do is launch a radical listening tour, 
where they actually not listen to weaponize, but try to really understand in the different counties in this country, what are the major concerns? What are the preferred remedies? And really listen to people because it is a way to open people up to thinking and feeling a little bit differently about you and the dynamic and the issues you're discussing. Uh, that, that's great. A, a, um, a therapist once gave me a kind of a mantra, um, which is when, when you're getting into a pattern, when you see a conflict escalating, just ask yourself, what would I say or do right now if my heart was fully open? Mm, yeah. And that just, it just, it's just like, you know, makes me stop and yeah. like, right, what is my intention? Is my goal to win? Or, yeah. you know, what am I trying yeah. to do here? So, yeah. um, very so starting hard to off, do, right? It's a very demanding thing to do, particularly if you, if you're angry and, you know, you really mm -hmm. have something that you're trying to work out with them. Yeah, but there's, but there's a moment, I think in Aristotle, when he writes about anger, talks about there's this moment when you could actually change the course. Mm -hmm. Once that moment is passed, it's very hard. Yeah. But yeah, just, you know, the person and, says something, are you going to take yeah. the bait or are you going to deescalate? And that's your and, only choice point. And what yeah. we've found in our research in the Difficult Conversations Lab is the moments come really early. It's mm -hmm. the first thing you say. It's the first, you know, gesture you make. It's your first rolling of the eyes or yeah. sucking of the, you know, it's those things. Voluntary expression, yeah. Right? Yeah. And once, as you say, once it's going, it, it, it will, you know, odds are it's going to stay in that trajectory. So yeah. going in somewhat mindful and somewhat prepared about do I want to set that off or do I want to take a different tack is key. Okay, great. Um, so I have a question for you about, about generations. You know, I've been studying why it is that people born after 1996 are so different from people born before about 1993. Uh, so Gen Z is really different, much higher rates of anxiety and depression. Uh, they, they arrived on campus around 2013, 2014, and they brought with them generally a threat mindset. And, they, and if, if somebody challenges their ideas, they take it as a personal attack. Yeah. Or again, this is not true for all, maybe not even most, but a lot. And, yeah. and the way people react, that criticism is a personal attack that then tends to really destroy any possibility of constructive dialogue in a classroom. Now it's in corporations. So I want to ask you, do you, have you seen any, is, are there differences by generation in people's ability um, to, ability to have uh, uh, difficult or disagreeing conversations? Have you noticed this in students at Teachers College? Uh, or is this just me pursuing uh, the, the thing I pursued in the Colony in the American Mind? Well, no, you know, as I, as I was alluding to earlier, what I am familiar with is that there is research on brain sensitivity, right? Uh, brain sensitivity to threat. Um, and that, you know, certain parts of the population are much more sensitive to a sense of threat and other parts of the population tend to be much more stimulated by, you know, interesting opportunities, stimulating mm -hmm. like, you know, a contradictions. It's like, oh, well, that's interesting, right? So there is, there, there does seem to be some kind of difference. I think it's normally distributed, but there, you know, that research is sort of suggesting that conservatives as a group tend to be more threat sensitive and therefore messages like the Mexicans are coming across the border mm -hmm. to take your, you know, that they tend to be much more sensitive and triggered by those than the left, but then progressives. Um, the generational question is a good question. I, I'm, I am familiar with your work on this. I, I don't, we have not seen that in our studies, but part of that is that, you know, we study mostly 25 year olds, give or take mm -hmm. 10 years, right? That's yeah. been primarily the population that we study. So we really haven't seen um, generational differences in mm -hmm. our data, um, but what we're hoping to do with you, you know, John and I are working together with his open mind initiative and our difficult conversations lab to, uh, and, and using virtual technology like this to sort of expand our impact and we hope to reach out much more broadly and investigate questions like that. But but to date, uh, that's yeah. not in our data. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. We have about five or ten, uh, five or seven minutes, let's say, of, of the two of us talking. Then we'll open up for questions. Right. Um, so let's let's talk about what uh, what you see, or not what you foresee. I don't want to. Eat. Well, what do you think is in store for our country? And what I mean by that is. Once, once, one in, in, once one understands your perspective about complex dynamical systems and how they can ch things can change under the surface 
parameters can change and nothing changes on the surface, then suddenly they can change quickly yeah. in unpredictable ways. And so while I, I, I therefore don't want to ask you like predict what's going to happen, but I do want you to think from all you've seen about the way conflicts play out, yeah. what's our best case scenario and our worst case scenario? Meaning what's like, what's a way that the these attractor spaces could change and, and 10 years from now, we look yeah. back on this and this was the low point and America rallied or changed or we changed some policy and then you know things got better. Yeah. Or what could happen in terms of like a descent into much worse, a lot more say political violence? Uh, give us best case, worst case scenarios. Yeah, really good question. So, um, you know, as I mentioned briefly in my talk and I describe in the book, this today is uh, an extremely opportune window of opportunity for us because of all the tumult and dis mm. uh, destabilization from COVID, from economic consequences of that, from Trump, from, you know, racial injustice. There is a sense of instability and destabilization. We've been trapped at home for many of us that were lucky enough to have homes for the last year and change. And now we're sort of emerging from this. So this is a window of opportunity. What we see when we study long-term protracted div device divided societies is that the vast majority of those societies tend to change. Um, somewhere between 75 and 90% of those tend to move out of divisiveness and into more constructive, peaceful eras, um, usually following some kind of major destabilization and, or shock like this, right? So the, the, the ground is fertile right now for us to pivot and for America okay. to come back together. And it doesn't mean that we're gonna embrace white supremacy or we're gonna embrace the other side. It means that we'll bring the guardrails back in and we'll be able to disagree and be able to tackle some of the more you know, threatening existential challenges that we're facing in terms of climate change and inequality and these other you know, extraordinary wolves that are at the door. Mm -hmm that need to be addressed, we need to be able to come together enough to do that. So the good news about these days is that it does present that time, but it's not something that will happen automatically. It's something that we, particularly this group in the middle, the exhausted middle majority, the 86% of Americans that disengage when there's you know crazy rhetoric happening in politics, we need to re-engage. We need to take our role seriously in this democracy. We need to, you know, find positive deviance in our communities. We need to find groups that are doing bridge building work and doing constructive work around mm -hmm. our democracy and join them in common cause. This is an opportunity if we really care about the future of the country for that to happen. Because the other thing that happens when political shocks like this occur is that things get a lot worse, right? Mm -hmm this kind of instability can lead to an era of much, much worse, or it can lead to a pivot. It's up to us. It's up to us mobilizing and committing to doing the things we need to do personally in our families and in our communities to choose which path we want to take. Hmm. Are there, so I, I wish I'd asked for just worst case scenario first and we could end on a more optimistic note. Yeah. Um, but do you think you know, in a developed Western democracy, uh, you know, obviously there have been some countries that were briefly democracies and that decayed into horribly violent uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, problems. But uh, is there, you know, are there examples of, of developed Western democracies that did descend into political violence? I mean, actually, well, I guess America had a lot of violence in, 19, in the 60s and 70s. Do you think that this is a, a really possible outcome for us? Well, yeah. So, you know, one of the Groups. One of the projects that I run is a project on studying sustainably peaceful societies, right? So Costa Rica, the Scandinavian mm. countries, Mauritius, Botswana. There are, there are countries around the world that are, by many metrics, uh, very peaceful in terms of their intergroup relations, their ethnic or religious relations mm -hmm. in terms of um, what many, the, the story of many of these places, like Costa Rica is a great example. Costa Rica in 1948 came out of a bloody, horrible civil war where thousands of people were killed. And they really took that moment, that opportunity to say enough. We need to mm. radically rethink what we do. In fact, Costa Rica was one of the only nations in the world that defunded their military, yeah. invested in education, the economy and, uh, and uh, the, their ecology and grew a different society. They intentionally mandated in every school 
uh, peace education, that they would teach tolerance mm. and conflict resolution and those kinds of skills. And they believe they grew a peaceful society over time. But there was this shock and this, this coming to terms, right, with how they got there, their responsibility in that, and their need to sort of really take, take a different tack. And this is a story that you hear in various places. Botswana is another place. Mauritius is another place. Mauritius is an interesting place. It's a very multicultural. It's the most peaceful nation in Africa. It's highly multicultural, different populations, different mm -hmm. religions, different ethnic populations. They too came out of some tense times and really they see that as something that they want to intentionally avoid, <clears throat> avoid going forward. So, you know, it, 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 these are stories around the world of other places that either came to the brink of violence like we may be at, or actually moved into violence and then pulled back and said enough. I'm hoping that we can avoid worse violence and come together enough. Okay, I'll take it. That's that's hopeful enough for me that we can look to countries like Costa Rica, uh, yeah. and that there are countries that have experienced violence and really just been able to been able to change. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think now let's uh, bring uh, Hakeem back to moderate the questions. Hello, hello. What a wonderful conversation, and you've certainly, I'm sure, primed the audience. Um, for lots to think about. So folks sent in questions in advance and we thank you so much for that. So we're gonna choose two questions from advance and then we'll choose one question from, from the live stream that's coming in. The first question we have here is, how do we engage with others who don't want to engage, are not likely to listen, or when the other side is intentionally divisive and unswayed by facts? Well, I'll, I'll start that and then I'll invite John in too, because his, his work, particularly with the Open Mind Initiative, is really about preparing people for these kinds of conversations and the kind of, you know, the building blocks for those. But, you know, I will go back to the question of, you know, why are you engaging? What's the point? What, what are you trying to do? You know, is it that you really want to try to challenge them and confront them and show them that they're wrong, which is the trap that most of us are in? And if that is what you want to do, then you're absolutely right. It's going to kind of create that. Part of what is important to reflect on is, do you think that they're going to ever change? Do you think that you're going to ever change, right? Do people change? Do these kinds of conflicts change? Or do they just, you know, do we just play this game over and over again? If you, if you really believe that they're not going to change, then guess what? They're not going to change because you're gonna either disengage or every time you engage with them, you're gonna follow the same kind of path that we talked about earlier. If you believe it's possible, and this is research based, we, they've done research in Israel, Palestine on these assumptions. These are our assumptions about do people and situations change? And if you believe they don't, then you either disengage from conflicts or you fight the fight. If you believe they can, and you see actually see evidence of people on the other side that are opening up and choosing different ways to engage. If you see enough of that, then you become more willing to try to engage in a very different way. So to me, the question is, do you believe that people can change? And what do you hope to have happen in those engagements? But, but John, I invite you to weigh in sure. as well. Yeah, I would say there's no question as to whether people can change or rather there's no question as to whether people can open up uh, and uh, uh, and have a, a collaborative conversation with you. All we have to do is is just look at Daryl Davis. And if you don't know who that is, just Google Daryl Davis Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he's a, an African-American blues musician who found himself talking to a KKK member uh, one night after his performance. And they actually connected over, I can't remember if it was music or Christianity, but the fact that they had something in common and then Daryl listened to him, and this is his superpower. And this, he, he's on the road now, he has books and TED Talks, he's brilliant. But the point was, just really listen to someone, let them say their piece, let them feel understood, and then they will actually listen to you. And maybe not 100%, but more than 50%. So there's no question that you can do this, and that it is a superpower that will actually be good for you, making you more effective working with other people. Uh, if you're a political activist of any sort, uh, you probably should stop the, any sort of confrontational or shaming approach, which just makes 
which turns people against you. Um, so I think if you if you sort of unmoralize things, or I, you know, I don't want to say demoralize, but you like strip out the rapid moral judgment, the demonizing, and just think about people are complex systems embedded in complex systems, and hmm. Could I maybe engineer a, like a little switch here? Could I maybe just for an hour get this person out of this attractor uh, in which he hates me over to this attractor in which we're just two parents talking about our kids or whatever it is. So after watching Daryl Davis and then reading your book because your book really helps explain how it is that he's able to do this and then he is then inspires so many more people. Um, so yeah, if you d don't think about it as oh that person does you know that person's evil and won't won't, won't ever listen they're so close minded. Uh, we're all human beings, and if he can talk a KKK member into giving up his robes, you can probably have a, a conversation with anyone. Yeah. Thank you. Second question for you: um, Where do you think we can find that balance between fighting for social justice? while maintaining relationships with people of different values and beliefs. Actually, I'd like to go first on, on this one. Right. Um, because I'm really interested in the ways that our, our, our moral emotions and our moral understanding um, is great for keeping us on a team, but it's terrible for solving problems. So I would say that there is not a balance between them. I would say uh, that if you are fighting for social justice, uh, you darn well better strip out all the moralism. You darn well better commit yourself to understanding because if you just do what your group is doing, there's a very good chance you're making things worse. And I'm trying to write an article right now. Uh, the, the working title of it is how to know which side is wrong or the easy way to know which side is wrong. And the easy way is just look at which side shoots its dissidents. If you're in a group in which if someone says, hey, wait a second, there's this contrary study, or wait a second, I heard that it's just the opposite or whatever. And if people are afraid to say that, if people on your team are afraid to dissent because they will be shamed or kicked out, then you could be pretty confident that you're wrong, that your side is wrong, that you, you're you disconnected from reality and you're caught in a moral bubble and you're in an attractor space. And uh, so, I would say what I see in social justice activism, when you compare to say Martin Luther King and the way that they studied the problem and they trained for it and they used love and they changed people. When you look at the way serious social justice uh, activists, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, when you look at the way they did things and you compare it to the way college students do social justice now, I would say there's not a balance, I would say, uh, you really need to look at your community and your methods and you really need to ask, is my goal here to gain status in my group or is my goal to actually change people? And if it's to change people and change situations and you shoot your dissidents, you're probably going about it the wrong way. Peter? Yeah, I agree with uh, with everything you said, John. I, I, I would add that bo both King and Mandela were highly adaptive. They were very strategic, strategic yes, and adaptive. Strategic to changes on the ground, to changes in circumstances, to power shifts. They were very mindful of how the context would evolve and they needed to sort of roll with that. So they didn't, they weren't dogmatic in how they uh, approach these things. So this question is, I think, a very important question because our my field of peace building um, and my other field of social justice um, are oftentimes in tension about this. And there are groups today, the Horizon Project is one, that are really looking at this. Like how do social justice, how does social justice activism learn from conflict resolution and peace building and vice versa? How can they mutually reinforce one another? Because again, peace building and conflict resolution is oftentimes about de-escalating things and trying to find some common ground and harmony and bring people together. And social activism is, is raising tension and drawing attention and mobilizing groups. I have to say that in my book, in the first chapter, I start with a parable, which is a group of women in Boston who, who were participated in a six year clandestine dialogue about pro-life and pro-choice in Boston. And one of the things that's fascinating about that is that they were activists. They were all activists on different sides of this cause. Um, and initially they had vilified each other and were terrified of each other, but agreed to come together because there had been some violence in 1994 in their mm -hmm. community and they wanted to, st and that was the common threat. And in coming together, they had 
a long, difficult series of conversations that, as I said, took almost six years. And in doing so, what they started to do is come to terms with their own limitations on their side, their own ambivalence. They, they, they discovered, right? It wasn't about only about persuading the other side that they're wrong and I'm right. It was a process of discovery where they learned about their own ambivalences, the negative consequences of their activism, you know, what, how they contributed to setting up the conditions where this violence was more likely to happen in their community. They, they unpacked a lot of what we don't do. And so it, 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 it's difficult work, but it's critical work for activists and peace builders to understand the unintended consequences of what they do and how both com communities can learn from each other to do more effective work with least negative consequences. Thank you. I've been keeping my eye here on the live chat and we have some wonderful questions and I think it's gonna come up on the screen. I will Great. start with one. This is from Jeff, who is currently in Mazatlan, Mexico. Hi, Jeff, thank you for your question. Um, he asks here, what policy or rules, reforms do you think will help decrease toxic polarization? Uh, well, I'll take, I'll take, I'll give one example of uh, an interesting group that's working on exactly that. So there is this um, not very well-known committee in Congress today. It is the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. And it's a bipartisan committee that was founded about a year and a half ago. It's chaired by a Democrat and, uh, and a Republican. The Democratic chair is Derek Kilmer of Washington. The Republican is William Timmons of South Carolina. And this committee uh, was tasked with, and this is something that Congress does every 20 or 25 years. They recognize that they're messed up, they're dysfunctional, they're broken, and they need to be repaired. And so they look at what to do. And this committee was given a, a one-year mandate to do that. And they have been very bipartisan. They split the budget. They have six members of Republicans, six Democrats. They meet always together. All of their meetings are together. Um, and the, their process has been so effective. They put out, a, I think, 98 recommendations for how, what Congress can do to bring the temperature down, to re reintroduce civil discourse into their process, um, that uh, there were several letters written to Nancy Pelosi saying, you have to extend the work of this committee. They need to stay on for two more, two more years. So this is in Congress, right? This is the belly of the beast of the problem. This is where on January 6th they were attacked. And yet you have this group that is working very constructively. But I have to say that the policies and the, re and the recommendations they offer are not radical or brain science. Here's one. What happens on the first day in Congress is the, the first day of a new Congress is the freshman class come in and they put the Democrats on the Democratic bus and the Republicans on the Republican bus and they drive off into different directions to start their you know, war plans. And so their first recommendation was, don't do that. <laughs> you know, that's not helpful, right? Bring them together into some kind of conversation about how do we do what we want to do in Congress with each other? How do we work together, right? So they've been, begun to identify these simple but structural things that contribute to the divisiveness. One of the things that I've been recommending, and John has spoken to, about this as well, is that one of the things that happened in the 1990s when we saw this pivot to politics as war in Washington was the Newt Gingrich decision to change the work week from five days in Congress to three days, and then to say to his Republican colleagues, don't move here, don't bring your families here, stay in your states, you can raise more money that way, and I don't want you fraternizing with the enemy anyway, so don't come here and don't bring your families here. And one of the things that did was it removed a critical what we call cross-cutting structure in the socialization of Washington that had existed for decades, where families grew up together, kids played sports together and went to, you know, religious class together and sang together. And, you know, and in those kinds of communities where you have those kinds of contexts, it's much more difficult to vilify the other. Um, we need more of that. We need more of that in Congress. I think Congress should extend, you know, at least encourage people to move back, even if they just go to four four days of, of work a week. 
But we also <clears throat> need this around the country. We've just done an analysis of some data of, the, you know, there are 3,000 plus counties in the country. We did an analysis of the top 1% of the most politically polarized countries and the bottom 1% to see what the comparison is. And one of the big factors is that in the top 1% where you have much less hostility across the political divide is you see more mixed political marriages, something like 25% mm. as opposed to 10%. You see uh, uh, religious organizations that bring people together across political divides. You see sports groups that do that. You have these, what we call cross-cuttingness that happens in these communities, which where people grow up together with one another, they go to the hospital together with them. They you know, uh, go to, um, are in labor unions with them. And when you have that kind of everyday contact, it, it leads to a better, more functional society. So that, that is a basic policy that scales, having these kinds of structures, which means that we all have to think about who we invite into our family to dinner for conversations, who we socialize with, who are our colleagues, who are you know people that we see in our neighborhood, in our communities. We need to rethink this segregation that's being that's happening, you know, at in at lightning fast speed, and put the brakes on it, and figure out ways to start to work against that. It can happen in Congress, um, and it should happen for all of us. Uh, so, yeah, I've got um, I've got three uh, three fairly simple policies that I think would each have a big effect by doing just what Peter's talking about. You you want changes to the system that will change the nature of interaction forever not just a one-shot thing like, yeah, don't send them off on the buses, that's a one-shot thing, that's nice. But here's three that would, I think, have much bigger effect. One, change the schedule in Congress, and this is what Norm Ornstein has suggested. He suggests three weeks in DC, one week off. It's so much more humane. They don't have to keep flying back and forth, back and forth. They st they live in DC, they, they, they socialize on the weekends, and then they go home for like nine days. So that would, that would have a huge impact. Number two, um, and all party primaries. We are the only democracy that has a, you know, a Republican primary and a Democratic primary, which is completely insane because that means since so few people vote, each party is nominating only the people who are extreme. But it's much worse than that because it's not just about who they elect. Once they get into Congress, they're afraid of compromising because they're, they don't care about the general election. That doesn't matter. They only care about the primary. And so the idea of, of party primaries, even an open party primary doesn't solve it. The party should have nothing to do with the primaries. You'd have an open primary the way California does or a, or a final five voting you, you open primary, the top five vote getters, you then go to a general election with ranked choice voting. There are a couple of schemes, but it's like, imagine if we put Coke and Pepsi in charge of, of what soft drinks get served in America's schools. Like, no, we would never do that because they're gonna recommend either Coke or Pepsi, no milk, no water. So we got to get the parties out of the elections, basically. Let them let them endorse people, let them put people up, but they should not be able to run primaries. Uh, third policy, uh, we must, must, must regulate social media in a, in, in a few ways. Uh, I think that things are just going to get worse and worse until we change the social media environment. And the biggest single change that I would recommend um, is we should impose know your customer laws on them the way we do for banks. That is, anyone can open an account with a fake name, that's okay, just to see what's going on. But if you want to post, if you want to be putting stuff out there, you have to be verified. Uh, and it doesn't mean you have to post under your real name, but all kinds of industries now are figuring out ways to verify people. You kick it out to a third party or a nonprofit, they simply verify that you're in a country, that you're a real person, and that you're over 13 or 18 or 21, whatever the age markers are. And that would knock out most of the trolls. That would knock out most of the Russian interference. It's just so easy to create fake accounts and then say nasty, racist, sexist stuff and threaten violence. So the public square is a cesspool because of Twitter and Facebook's open policies. That must change if our democracy is to survive, I believe. So that's it. Change the yeah. schedule and party primaries, regulate social media. So let me just say one, make one point that connects John's point with some of the other earlier points. I, I completely agree that we need to rein in the wild west of social media. Um, but it's not only the government that needs to do that. 
we also, as consumers, need to mobilize to do that. And that is a way that social activists and that is the way that the exhausted middle majority can kind of rise up and say, look, we won't do this. We won't, you know, we'll jump off this. We'll, we'll boycott one. We'll move to another. We want these kinds of policies that create a more healthy virtual society. Um, we really have to demand that. I think that's within our power and we have to recognize that because just complaining that the government doesn't do enough is not sufficient, right? We have the power to empower ourselves to demand that kind of change. Thank you. Let's choose one last question. It's from Shyla Talkman. Hi, Shyla. Um, says your obvious question that still needs to be clearly plotted. Who benefits from toxic polarization? Yeah, well, again, the the simple answer is that too many. I mean, uh, you know, as I've said, politicians will divide and conquer and they can benefit if, if their approach is uh, division and divisiveness, they can benefit. Um, you know, party uh, party strength can benefit from this, at least in the short term. Um, social media platforms benefit from it because it's part of the addictive addictive dynamic. Um, but also, you know, uh, um, general media, um, the you know the uh, mainstream media industry as well um, has tapped into this. I mean, you know, Donald Trump was a boom for. MSNBC and CNN and Breitbart and Fox, you know, it just brought all of this energy back into journalism, even the New York Times, right? In some ways, the provocations of someone like Trump brought the importance of the media um, back to the fore, but also, you know, their, their business model started to really organize around that. So, um, you know, that, that, that would be my response. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would focus on um, uh, certain uh, elements of mainstream media. I think the New York Times did not used to benefit from it, but a lot of people have observed that under Trump, they really changed and they become uh, an organization that benefits from getting more Team Blue subscribers if they focus on that. So there's still, a prof you know, I think one of the best professional organizations out there, yeah. although I think The Economist is the only place I go where I actually totally trust them. Um, but in general, I would say that there are very few beneficiaries here other than those whose business models rely on it. Politicians are the victims. They're actually the worst victims than we are. I mean, we, you know, we are annoyed by it. But most Congress people I've met, most politicians at every level got into it because they actually want to make a difference. They're hardworking people. Uh, they they want to help the country. They're usually patriotic. And, and once they get there, they say, oh my God, this is horrible. It's like, I've been thrown into the Coliseum and you know the other side has maces and nets and we've got, so, you know, okay, we have to fight, what do we do? So I think that uh, almost everybody here is a victim other than uh, Facebook, Twitter, Fox News, and to some extent, recently the New York Times and other media outlets. And so once again, I think we have to sort of demoralize this and not think this is a giant conspiracy. It's a kind of a social dilemma that we kind of wandered into because of the nature of our media systems and our economy. You know, uh, Hakeem, I'll just build on that for one second and say that one of the things that we do from a complexity science perspective, when we're working with uh, a very difficult conflict where people have vilified each other and hate each other, is as opposed to sitting them at a table and having them talk to each other, we ask them to get up and we put you know, a bunch of white paper on a wall and we ask them to start to list out all of the things that pit them against one another. And then to start to kind of draw lines between one or the other. So I've done this with, I did this with a violent union labor uh, um, dispute that I was working with. And part of what happens when you do that is people start to, first of all, physically get up and, and put the problem out here. So it's not me seeing you as the problem, but we're, we're co-creating this problem. But the other thing that happens is you start to see how big it is and how much is, is acting on us so that we are victimized by this set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what do you and I do about this, right? So it, it, it's a simple technique that we use that is always very powerful because if you sit at a table across from someone, it's very easy to personalize the problem. You know, unions crazy, you're brutes, you're thugs, you're the you're the problem. You know, management is clueless. They're the problem. You know, it's it's a very simple dynamic that we all fall into. But if you ask them to unpack it 
and start to realize the constellation of things that are pulling us apart and pitting us against each other, it gives them some insight about what they both could do in order to bring the heat down and to try to move forward together. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, John, um, for this wonderful conversation. Peter, thank you for writing this book. Here is my copy right here. Um, I'm probably gonna take um, pieces of it and give it to my students. Thank you so much to the audience members who took time out to join us this evening. If you submitted a question, thank you so much. We will choose the raffle winners at random and we'll contact you via email to send you your own specially signed copy of the book by Peter Coleman. Um, as I sit here in Gettysburg, Gettysburg is at the psychological crossroads of the United States. I am always reminded of the American Civil War living in this place here. And I definitely don't want us to get back there. There's much work to be done. May our better selves prevail. Thank you all for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Hakeem. Thank you, everybody, for attending and, and joining us. Enjoyed this very much. <laughs>